while I live, I grow. What I want to talk to you about is not really what I've done, but the things I've learnt over the last few years. And this story starts back in a time when Keanu Reeves was young and cool, when someone called Monica Lewinsky was hitting the headlines, when if you wanted to play a game while you were out and about, you took your Game Boy. And people actually use these Nokia mobile phones to make phone calls. And a little company called Google had just started up um, to help people work out what the internet was. And at this time, I was a young junior doctor uh, as a resident doing my first shift at the children's hospital. And that was on the children's cancer ward. And I was pretty uh, worried about what I would see and how I would feel and how I would cope. And uh, imagined a very dark and gloomy very sad environment uh, of kids going through unimaginable things. And I was surprised actually that it was actually looked more like this. It was a happy place. There was laughter, there were clowns, there was music, there was even dancing. And one of the first things I learned is just about how much the, our children and our patients can inspire us. How they're the ones who are optimistic who just want to get on with it, who, look, look, who see only the good things and have an amazing resilience to get through the, the things that are thrown at them. And in fact, my patients have spent many weeks, months and even years in ISO and in lockdown. They're used to being stared at by people wearing masks. They're used to being excluded from school and sometimes even they've had to zoom into school and you know what? They get through it. And when we go back to them years later to see how they've done, what we find is they're thriving and actually they're more resilient and stronger in many ways than their peers. And it's that resilience that is what inspires us. But in fact, one of the reasons it's also such a happy place is because kids with cancer actually do very well. Their cure rates are very high. And it wasn't always this way. This young girl, if we go back to the 1950s, she had leukaemia and she's actually notable because her father was George Bush Senior, her brother was George W. Bush and they even talked about her recently when George Bush Senior died and the lasting impact her diagnosis had on their family because she went, when she was diagnosed with leukaemia, her parents were told, take her home, it's incurable, uh, there's nothing we can do. And they didn't accept this, they went around looking for cures but there were none and eventually she did die from her leukaemia. But it was parents at this time who said, well, this isn't good enough. We can't just be told, take, take our children home. We need to do better. And they started, they started raising money to try and improve things. To put it in the words of a haematologist at the time, there is nothing worse than to make a diagnosis of acute leukaemia. The family is deluged with suggestions, and in the meantime, the patient goes steadily downhill. Much as one hates to admit it, there is practically nothing to offer in the acute or rapid case of leukaemia. So these parents said, no, we need to do better. And people started doing research. They started growing leukaemia cells in the lab. They started, actually the first children had to be treated in the basement of the hospital by a young Jewish doctor who, who wanted to do better, but was told it's wrong to experiment on these children. And those first children who started to go into remission were treated in secret in the basement. But then he started to see some cures. And gradually, over the years and decades, that cure rate has exceeded to the point where now, for this, the most common cancer of childhood, the cure rate exceeds over 90%. And in fact, um, the, the treatment of leukaemia is probably one of the most remarkable success stories in modern medicine. And around that time that I was telling you about, you know, the question was how can we make this cure rate even higher and how can we improve treatments for other cancers with things other than chemotherapy and people were discovering these new targeted therapies like this drug called Gleevec that was making the headlines. So I headed off to Boston which is where Gleevec was discovered to try and learn about these new therapies to see how, how we can help other children with cancer. And when I came back to Sydney really we wanted to focus on some of those children who don't do as well as those with leukaemia, such as those with brain tumours. And in fact, brain tumours is the number one disease that causes the most deaths in childhood even to this day. And there's some tumours like one called DIPG, which 
actually from day one still remain incurable. And these children present like this. They're usually young, typically around five or seven years of age. They often have very mild symptoms, a little tilt of their head. Maybe their eyes don't line up um, properly. It's usually just come on over one or two weeks and yet we do a scan and we find this tumour and we know from that moment that this child is incurable that they're, that, that, and that most of these children will die within a year of that diagnosis. And if we go back to this quote from that haematologist decades ago and we take out the words acute leukaemia and we put in the word DIPG, there is nothing worse than to make a diagnosis of DIPG the family is deluged with suggestions, and in the meantime, the patient goes steadily downhill. Much as one hates to admit it, there is practically nothing to offer in the acute or rapid case of DIPG. And so this quote, which sounded quaint and almost absurd, actually still holds true for this uh, incurable tumour. And in fact, if we talk about other famous people, this other famous person is Neil Armstrong, and around the time where people were trying to achieve the impossible of flying to the moon, something that people dreamed would never actually happen, his daughter was diagnosed with DIPG and he was given that same message. The, the worst message I think that any doctor can ever have with a parent to tell them there's nothing we can do for your child. And one of the problems is about this tumour is that it's in such a critical part of the brain that you can't remove it. And because you can't remove it, you can't take it to the lab and you can't study it in the lab. And when I suggested, when I came back saying, well, let's start up a research program to this tumour called DIPG, other scientists in the research institute looked at me and said, what are you talking about? They'd never heard of it. This is actually the most uh, incurable cancer, the most aggressive cancer in either children or adults, and these scientists researching it had never heard of it because no one had ever studied it in the lab before. So how could we do this if surgeons wouldn't operate and wouldn't be prepared to, to touch these tumours? And we thought, well, let's maybe offer them parents the, ch the chance to have their child's tumour donated after their child has passed away. Um, and we thought we, what we can do is take these tumours, grow the cells and actually start to find drugs that actually make the cells die that actually might for the first time provide us with a potential treatment. So we started writing grants trying to raise money and we were told it's impossible. There's no way you can grow cells from this tumour. Even There's no way parents will agree to have this tumour donated. Even if they do, after a child's died, the tumour will be dead. You can't possibly grow living cells in this sort of situation. But it was actually parents of these children, like little Benny and little Amy, whose, whose children had died, who said, and we agreed with them, well, maybe it's not, just not, it's not impossible, it just hasn't been done yet. And it was that they who actually got, started raising money and helping us to try and set this up. And then... For the first time, we actually were able to grow these tumour cells in the lab. And this is the picture we took on that first day when, for the first time in Australia, we were able to actually grow these DIPG tumour cells. And not only that, but we actually created models in mice. We've almost got a little mouse hospital. We've actually created exactly the same tumour in mice that we see in children to allow us to actually test these new potential treatments. And we use the robotic te technology that we've had now to screen thousands of drugs to see if anything might be active. And in fact, what we've found is most drugs that we test are completely inactive. But we've grown the program and we've grown the team and that's one of the other lessons we've learned. You can't do this on your own. You need as many people as you can helping you. And as we've grown, we've actually started to find new drugs. And we've had to look in unexpected places and look for things that we never would have dreamed of, like... For example, a drug that we'd normally use to treat malaria, we found is stunningly active. And we've now got our number of leading candidates that we're very hopeful will actually provide the first real treatments that we're taking into clinical trial for this disease. The other thing we've decided to do is we don't want to just do research in the lab for years that eventually we take into clinical trial. How can we bring all the these scientists and this technology actually in real time to help children who today who come to us and need new treatments. And we've set up this program called the Zero Childhood Cancer Program where 
It's actually one of the most in-depth tumour profiling anyone's doing in the world. We'll take a, a child's tumour at the time they're diagnosed and we'll put it through this incredibly detailed sequencing where we look at every single gene in that tumour to the extent where we get a book, uh, the equivalent of a book that's so big it would have two and a half million pages full of information. And we use, and our scientists and computers scour through that information looking for a single mistake. And if they find a mistake, then we decide, is there a drug we have that can target that mistake, which we might be able to use for this child? And so we had a child, for example, with a DIPG where we did find a mistake. We found a mistake in a gene that's usually found in, mel in melanoma. Uh, no, sorry, in this case, it was uh, breast cancer. And we actually took breast cancer drugs and treated this child with breast cancer drugs. And for the first time in my life, we actually saw that tumour shrink and disappear. We had another child with another sort of brain tumour where we found a melanoma genetic change. And in this case, this child was, uh, had failed chemotherapy, had tumour that was spreading throughout his brain and spine, uh, was having terrible headaches, was bed bound, uh, really was, was in a terrible condition. His parents were desperate. They asked us to run this program. We found this genetic change. These, we found drugs that are really only approved for melanoma, but we managed to get them for this child. And within a few days, he was up in a wheelchair. In a couple of weeks, he was up walking. At day 45, he was back playing tennis. And here he is a year later. And in fact, it's now almost two years later, and he's completely disease-free with no evidence of any tumour in his brain or his spine. And they say if you can save one life, it's like saving an entire world. But for us, we still have more patients and one life isn't enough. So there's always a long list of things to do. We may have flown to the moon, but in some ways it feels like now we're trying to fly to Mars. It's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of people... Uh, putting in hours and hours. My team comes in at 5am, some of them, to start this work and to try and find these new treatments. But it's through all that effort that we are convinced that we will be able to reach for the stars and get to Mars. And the reason is because of our patients. It's these children who have passed away, like Benny and Amy and Finley and Isaac, Eli, Isabella Marcus, Gemma, Levi, Danair. It's these patients who inspire us to keep going. It's their parents who want us to forge on. And th through their encouragement, and what greater gift could we have than to allow us to work on their child's tumour after they've passed away? And I guess the biggest thing I've learned is about the human spirit. The spirit of the children who face down this adversity, most of whom do well, but many of whom still don't and also of their parents who have been through the worst possible trauma that any parent could ever imagine. And yet when they come out the other side, what they want to do is actually to help other people. And that is, I think, how we can all make a difference in the world. It's by looking at the bad, looking at the terrible, looking at the unimaginable, and instead of cowering in the face of it, uh, rising up against it and trying to make the world a better place. Thank you.